Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the phospholipase C beta enzymes. Okay, right. Uh, so we've just discussed the um, reaction that all phospholipase C enzymes are going to catalyze, which is this uh, breakdown of phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate, uh, which you have a little bit of in the uh, phospholipid bilayer uh, of the cell membrane. Okay, into uh, the two products, diacylglycerol and also inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate. Okay, so, uh, what we now want to move on to is discussion of all the different forms of phospholipase C enzymes. And then we want to focus in on the phospholipase C beta family of enzymes. We want to look at the structure of the phospholipase C beta enzymes. And then we want to look at how they're activated by uh, the alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, right. Uh, so, we're going to start off then by looking at the different families of phospholipase C enzymes. Now, I want to include a reference now because uh, everything that I've told you so far is standard textbook stuff. You can find this in any biochemistry textbook. Uh, but what I'm about to tell you is more difficult to find in textbooks, so I'll give you a review that uh, has it in. Okay, so um, Lion et al. Uh, is a review that was written in 2013. The first author was Lyon, um, and uh, there's another author as well, but it's a review specifically on phospholipase C beta enzymes, and that's where I got the information that I'm about to present to you from. Okay, right. Uh, so let's start off with all the different types of phospholipase C enzymes, and then we'll focus in on the phospholipase C beta enzymes. Okay, right. So firstly, let's look at the different forms of phospholipase C enzymes. So there are 13 different genes for phospholipase C enzymes, okay? And uh, these will all code for slightly different enzymes. They'll all have different sequences of organic bases, and therefore they will code for proteins with different sequences of amino acids, okay? And these proteins will have slightly different properties. They'll be uh, regulated by different things, etc. Okay, now, um, these phospholipase C enzymes are grouped into uh, six families, oh, sorry, in fact, seven families, okay? Uh, you have the phospho, sorry, no, it is six families. Uh, you have the phospholipase C beta family, okay, which is the one that we're uh, going to be interested in, which contains uh, four members in total. It contains the phospholipase C beta 1, gene. Uh, then you have the phospholipase C beta 2 gene, and that's a comma there. Okay, then the phospholipase C beta 3 gene, and then finally the phospholipase C beta 4 gene. So those are four separate genes that code for different forms of phospholipase C enzymes. Okay, and many of these have multiple splice variants, but I'll come back to that in a moment. So these four genes code for the phospholipase C beta family of enzymes, and it is this family of phospholipase C enzymes that we are going to focus on uh, for the rest of this video. Okay, but just for a complete picture, I'll now present the other uh, families of phospholipase C enzymes as well. So the next family is the phospholipase C gamma family, and this contains only two members. This contains phospholipase C gamma 1 and phospholipase C gamma 2. Okay, so these are quite different from um, the phospholipase C betas. They're not activated by uh, G alpha Q slash 11 uh, subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. In fact, none of the other forms of phospholipase C are activated by the alpha Q slash 11 uh, subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, that's something that's special for the phospholipase C beta family. Okay, then there is the phospholipase C delta family, which contains uh, three members. It contains phospholipase C delta 1. Then there is no phospholipase C delta 2. So we go straight on to phospholipase C delta 3. And then finally, we have phospholipase C delta 4. Okay, so those are the three phospholipase C delta enzymes. 
Then we have uh, the phospholipase C epsilon family, and in the phospholipase C epsilon family, there is only one member. Okay, so this is often just called phospholipase C epsilon. However, some people will call it phospholipase C epsilon 1. Okay, uh, next family, we've got the phospholipase C uh, eta family. Okay. So the Greek letters are becoming fancier and fancier. Um, so there are two members within the phospholipase C eta family, uh, which are phospholipase C eta 1 and then phospholipase C eta 2. Okay? And then finally, there is the phospholipase C zeta family, okay? which is that Greek symbol there. And in the phospholipase C zeta family, there is only one enzyme. Uh, which again is just called phospholipase C zeta, uh, but some people will call this phospholipase C zeta 1. So if you don't know these Greek symbols, this one is eta, and this one here is zeta. Okay, right. So um, we're you, they're, they're just letters in the Greek alphabet if you want to look them up. Right, so those are the 13 different genes then for phospholipase C enzymes. We have four in the phospholipase C beta family, two in the phospholipase C gamma family, that takes us up to six, three in the phospholipase C delta family, that takes us up to nine, one in phospholipase C epsilon, ten, two in phospholipase C ep uh, eta, rather, and that takes us up to 12, and one in phospholipase C zeta, that takes us up to 13. So overall, 13 different genes for phospholipase C enzymes. Now, we're not going to be bothered with all the other five families here. We're only going to now focus on this phospholipase C beta family. And this is the family which, when people say phospholipase C without clarifying which family they mean, generally they will mean the phospholipase C beta family of enzymes, because these are the ones which are activated by uh, G-alpha Q slash 11 subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins and are therefore part of that protein kinase C pathway. Okay, that's activated by uh, G protein coupled receptors. Right, uh, so I want to now focus in on this family. I want to tell you about the four different forms, where you find them within the human body, and the fact that three of these have multiple splice variants. Okay, so firstly I'm going to tell you about the concept of splice variants. Okay, I'm just going to remind you of the central dogma of biology. So, let these two lines here represent uh, the two strands of a piece of double-stranded DNA. Okay, so they're the two complementary strands. Okay, and I'm now going to box a region of this double-stranded DNA, like so, and I'll highlight this in blue. And this boxed region of the double-stranded DNA, this will represent some gene for a phospholipase C beta enzyme. Okay, so let's say, for instance, this is the phospholipase C beta 1 gene, okay? Uh, then um, one of the strands of the double-stranded piece of DNA will actually be used by RNA polymerase 2 to actually make the piece of mRNA from, okay? Whilst the other will not, the strand that is actually going to be used by the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme to make the mRNA is known as the coding strand. Okay, so the one I'm highlighting in purple, I'm going to let be the coding strand. Whilst the one that then is complementary to the coding strand, but which isn't used by RNA polymerase 2 to make the piece of mRNA from, this is known as the non-coding strand. So here in turquoise, this represents the non-coding strand. Okay, so what will then happen is that the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme, which for short I'll abbreviate to rna P for polymerase, and then I'll put a 2 there, RNAP2, okay? Uh, this will work along the coding strand, like so, and synthesize a piece of mRNA that is complementary to the coding strand. So in red here, this is our piece of mRNA, okay? So I'll draw this piece of mRNA now out over here. So here's our piece of mRNA in red. Now, this piece of mRNA is then going to be translated into protein. However, it cannot be translated yet. It firstly has to go through post-transcriptional modifications. Okay, this piece of RNA here is not ready to go through a ribosome. It's called a piece of pre-mRNA. Okay, or well, it's called the primary transcript, if you like. 
Um, and the reason that this is not ready to go for a ribosome yet and be translated is that there are portions in this uh, pre-mRNA that are not supposed to be translated. Okay, so let me box the portions that are supposed to be translated. So let's say this portion is supposed to be translated, this portion is supposed to be translated, and this portion also is supposed to be translated. These three portions that I've boxed here that are supposed to be translated, these are what are known as the exons. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, the portions in between the exons that are not supposed to be translated, this portion, this portion, this portion, and this portion, these are called the introns. Okay, so in the pre-mRNA, you have portions that are actually supposed to be translated, the exons, and then you have the portions in between the exons that are not supposed to be translated. These are called the introns. Okay, now before you can put the pre-mRNA, well, before you can actually put the pre-mRNA through a ribosome, you need to cut these introns out and then re-stick the exons back together. Okay, so this process of cutting out the introns and then re-gluing the exons back together, this is known as splicing, and it will produce a much smaller piece of mRNA down here, which will just consist of the exons stuck back together, and this is known as a mature mRNA, or a mature piece of mRNA, and this can now go on to be translated into a protein. Okay, so this can become a polypeptide or a protein. Okay, right, through the process of translation. So, um, the concept then of multiple splice variants, the concept of a gene being able to produce more than one type of protein comes from the fact that if you... Um, well, you, what you'll do is you'll transcribe and you'll produce this piece of pre-mRNA. Some pieces of pre-mRNA from some genes have multiple different ways that you can then splice it, okay? So sometimes there isn't just one way that you can splice your pre-mRNA, okay? There are different ways that you can splice up this pre-mRNA, and those different ways of splicing up the pre-mRNA will produce different mature mRNAs. So let me give you a very easy to understand example of this. So imagine that actually this exon in the middle, this small one that I've drawn here, imagine that that one is an optional exon. I, you can either include it in the uh, mature mRNA, or you can get rid of it as though it was an intron. Okay? So, if that was the case, then you would be able to produce two different uh, sorts of mature mRNAs from this piece of pre-mRNA. Okay, either you could uh, make the mature mRNA where you have all three exons within it, okay, or you could make a mature mRNA where you only have the first and the last exon in it. That would be a slightly shorter mature mRNA than this full mRNA here. Okay, and those can now both be translated, okay, and this one will produce a slightly shorter protein, okay, so we'll call that protein 1, and this one can produce protein 2. Okay, so now what we've got is a single gene leading to two different types of protein, basically, um, and this is through these different ways of splicing the pre-mRNA, okay, that's a very simple example. Uh, some genes can have a huge number of different ways that their pre-mRNAs can be spliced up, leading to a vast plethora of different mature mRNAs and then a vast plethora of different proteins at the end, and these multiple proteins that you get at the end, these are known as the different splice variants of the gene. Okay, so we call these the splice variants of uh, phospholipase C beta 1. So the basic concept is that there are multiple different ways that you can splice the pre-mRNA, and this will result in different mature mRNAs, which will then go and produce different proteins, basically. Okay, so we want to see this concept in action for the phospholipase C beta enzymes, then. So, for phospholipase C beta 1, there are two known splice variants, okay? Um, these are called phospholipase C beta 1A and also phospholipase C beta 1B, 
Okay, so it's a nice, simple naming system. So basically, the phospholipase C beta 1 is a gene. It then has two different proteins it can produce because of variations in the way we splice up the pre mRNA from the phospholipase C beta 1 gene. And these are called the phospholipase C beta 1A protein and then also the phospholipase C uh, beta 1B protein. Okay, right. Uh, now on to the phospholipase C beta 2 um, gene. Again, this has two splice variants as well. Okay, it has phospholipase C beta 2A and again phospholipase C beta 2B. Okay, so those are the two different proteins that you produce from the same gene. Okay, I might just give this a little title that we're talking about the different splice variants here. Phospholipase C beta 3 only has one known splice variant. Okay, so the phospholipase C beta 3 um, gene uh, only is only known to produce one protein, and this protein is just called phospholipase C beta 3. Okay, finally, uh, the phospholipase C beta 4 gene, this again has two splice variants. It has phospholipase C beta 4A and phospholipase C beta 4B. Okay, right, so that's the different splice variants of these three, four, rather, different uh, phospholipase C beta uh, enzyme genes. Okay, right, so that means that overall there are seven different phospholipase C beta enzymes. Right, so what I now want to discuss is the different uh, localizations of these phospholipase C beta enzymes, i.e. which tissues are they present within. Okay, and for this I'll get another piece of paper. Right, so let's begin with the phospholipase C beta 1 enzymes. Okay, so... Uh, these include those two splice variants, phospholipase C beta 1A and phospholipase C beta 1B. Okay, basically, phospholipase C beta 1 enzymes are found within the brain. Okay, specifically, they're found within the cerebral cortex of the brain. Okay, and also another special area called the hippocampus. So let me just uh, show you where these areas are. So I'll draw a little picture of the brain. Um, and I'll try out, well, we can see the cerebral cortex very easily. Hippocampus is slightly more difficult to show. So let's draw a picture of the brain from the side. So we're looking at someone's brain from the side. Okay, so here is the left cerebral hemisphere. So we're looking from the left-hand side. Okay, and emerging from underneath the left cerebral hemisphere, you then have the brain stem coming out here. So here's the pons, here's the medulla, here's the spinal cord, and here is the cerebellum here. Okay, right, so let's just colour in little bits here. So we have the pons there in blue, okay, we have the medulla down here in orange, um, we have the cerebellum in pink here, and we'll come back to the cerebellum. One of the other ones will be uh, localised within the cerebellum. So let me just label up this picture. So this is the cerebellum, which literally means little brain. Okay, and then you have the components of the brain stem that are just poking out from underneath the cerebral hemispheres. Uh, we have the medulla down here in orange, and then the spinal cord below, but I won't label that up, and then the pons. Now, the cerebral cortex is all of this stuff that you can see up here, okay? So it's the outermost surface of the cerebral hemispheres. So all of what we see here, this is cerebral cortex, okay? The stuff that's underneath, if you were to, you know, take a pin and poke it in, okay? The stuff underneath isn't the cerebral cortex. Cortex means the outer layer of something. So the cerebral cortex is the outer layer of the cerebral hemispheres. Okay, so what we can see here, this is the cerebral cortex. So the cerebral cortex is grey matter, basically, and the difference between white matter and grey matter of the brain is that grey matter contains the cell bodies of neurons, whereas white matter contains the axons of neurons. Okay, so the cerebral cortex has a huge number of cell bodies of neurons, and these cell bodies of neurons will have phospholipase C beta 1 enzymes within them. 
Okay, coming on to the hippocampus. The hippocampus is slightly more difficult to show because it's buried within the temporal lobe of the cerebral hemisphere. So this sort of lobe that's coming out here, this is known as the temporal lobe. And to show the hippocampus, what I'm probably going to have to do is uh, take a cross section of the temporal lobe because the hippocampus sort of sits like this uh, within the temporal lobe. So it's underneath um, the cerebral cortex, underneath the white matter that's underneath that of the temporal lobe. And it's sort of wrapped, it's got the, the temporal lobe sort of wrapped around it. So if I now take a cross section that's sort of cut through like this and have a cross section, what you'll see is something that looks like this. Okay, so here is uh, the cerebral cortex of the parietal lobe here. Then we have this fissure here between um, the parietal lobe above here and the temporal lobe below it, and this is called the lateral fissure. Okay, so I'll try and uh, draw parallels here. So this line in red here, this is this portion here. Okay, then we're reaching this fissure here, which I'll colour in purple, and this is coming in like so. And it actually opens up like this inside here. And then there's a portion of the cortex that faces into this sort of hollow portion, um, which is known as the insula. Okay, so this is the lateral fissure here in purple. Okay, lateral fissure. Lateral because it's on the side. Okay, and then that red portion, this is part of the parietal lobe cerebral cortex. So this is the parietal lobe, okay? And then below that, we then have the temporal lobe cerebral cortex, which will come down like this. And basically, the hippocampus is then sitting um, in this sort of um, sausage-like shape here, running along with the temporal lobe here, okay? So it's, this is, we're just seeing a cross-section of it now, okay? So this is the hippocampus, and it's very important in uh, memory. Okay, so uh, that's another place where you have phospholipase C beta 1 enzymes uh, found in a high uh, level. Okay, right. Uh, now let's go on to uh, phospholipase C beta 2 enzymes and where those are found. So remember, we have two splice variants of phospholipase C beta 2 enzymes. Uh, we have phospholipase C beta 2A and phospholipase C beta uh, 2B. Okay, so these are found in the red blood cells and the white blood cells within your blood. Okay, they're also found in the platelets. So they're found in pretty much all of the cells of your blood. So RBC stands for red blood cells. Uh, leukocytes is the fancy uh, word for white blood cells. Okay, I should have put erythrocytes. That's the fancy word for red blood cells. Okay, so erythrocytes. So I'll draw a little picture of this as well. I'll draw an erythrocyte. I can manage that. Okay, so remember, um, erythrocytes are in this biconcave disc shape, so they look like a dumbbell if you see them from the side like this. Okay, so there's our erythrocyte, and also in the platelets, and the fancy word for platelets is thrombocytes. So the collective name for all of the sort of cellular structures within the blood, the erythrocytes, the leukocytes, and the thrombocytes, is to call them the hematopoietic cells. Okay, because um, they are derived from the hematopoietic stem cells. So these are the hematopoietic cells. Right, so you find phospholipase C beta 2 enzymes highly expressed within cells of the hematopoietic uh, type. Okay, right, now let's move on to phospholipase C beta beta-3 enzymes and where you find those localized. Okay, so once again, phospholipase C beta-3 is found uh, within the brain, so within nerve cells. Okay, you also find it within the liver, so within hepatocytes. So I'll draw a crude little picture now of the liver. Okay, here is our liver, and I'll colour that in orange. There we go. Um, then, uh, the other place you find it uh, is the parotid gland, which is one of your salivary glands. So I'll attempt to draw a picture of the side of someone's face so I can just remind you where the parotid gland is. And you can easily palpate this. Okay, so uh, let's start by drawing someone's face here. So we're looking at someone's head from the side now. 
Okay. Um, so I'll come down front here, and then here's your nose, here's your mouth, chin there. Okay, and then we'll have your mandible going up like so. Okay, something's gone wrong there. That should have come round like this a little bit more, and then the neck should have come down like this. But never mind. Okay. You get the picture. Here is the mandible here, okay? And sitting externally to the mandible, you have a large salivary gland here, okay? Known as the parotid gland, so in red here. This is the parotid gland, so if you feel at the side of your mandible, uh, you can't actually feel the bone, instead you feel this sort of squashy thing. That is your parotid gland there, okay? And it's a very large salivary gland. It's releasing saliva. Okay, right. Uh, so you find phospholipase C beta free within the cells of the parotid gland. Finally, phospholipase C beta four enzymes. Uh, these are found uh, heavily within the cerebellum. Okay, so I said we come back to the cerebellum. So remember, there are two spice vents of phospholipase C beta four, phospholipase C beta four A, and phospholipase C beta four B, and those are found in the cerebellum. Okay, right, uh, so we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video what we'll do is we'll start discussing the structure of phospholipase C beta enzymes.